Do you feel like we really have free will in life? Or do you think that someone up there is like pulling the strings? Like something is guiding us. I really believe that someone is guiding us. Like there's, there must be a God somewhere. Yeah. Hey guys, before we get into the video, I want to give a huge shout out to this new little hat. Cool, huh? Also, I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of this episode, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN provider which allows you to surf the web securely and privately. And it does so in part by providing another service, which is changing your virtual location. So what does that mean? Basically, everyone in the world experiences the internet differently based on where they are in the world. But by using Surfshark, you can change your virtual location so that you're not bound by your location's internet restrictions. For instance, if you wanted to see what the Netflix looks like in the UK, or let's say you get that pop-up on YouTube that says, this video is not available in your country, using Surfshark and making a couple clicks, you can change your virtual location so that it appears you're in a different location. And all the while, your data is being protected and is not being tracked or worse, sold to other companies. And with so many VPN providers out there, why not choose one that has tens of thousands of positive reviews and one that supports many of your favorite creators like me? So if you want to try it yourself, go to surfshark.deals maddie or use my coupon code M-A-D-D-Y at checkout and get your first three months free. Links in the description. And with that, we move on to the video. Bonjour and welcome to Give It To Me Straight. My name is Maddie Morphosis and on the show today, we have a special guest from RuPaul's Drag Race Season 12 and the host of Drag Race France, Miss Nikki Dahl. Bonjour, 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 everyone. Hi, welcome. Maddie. Hello, welcome, welcome to Vegas. Or I guess you like goodbye because like, you're about to be leaving Vegas. Soon. Literally leaving next week. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that you were here so, so long because this whole time I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna catch Nikki whenever she comes in. Yep. And then I saw a post here for like your farewell show for Vegas, and I was like, oh well, shit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to commit for more than six weeks because I really did not know what I would expect regarding Vegas, mm -hmm. and. I love it. This is really fun. Mm -hmm. Now, I love it on a work aspect. I don't know if socially I really yeah. crave a Vegas experience. Socially, no? Well, it's not like the easiest place to like hang out or like, it's not like, I'm from Paris. Like I love to walk around. Here, if you walk around, you end up on a highway. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and I don't drive. So it doesn't yeah. help. How's it been performing at Drag Race Live while well, in the meantime, you have your episodes of Drag Race France season two are airing right now. How's it been? Um, it's been very busy, uh, mostly on social media because I have to alternate between being the tired ass showgirl from Vegas slash the host of Drag Race Friends. Uh, but it's been going well because people that actually are coming to see the show sometimes have watched, you know, uh, Drag Race Friends if they care to read the subtitles because a lot of Americans don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's fun because they get to see the host uh, being a queen and not just behind, you know, the, the desk judging yeah. bitches. We have you and Pangina, so we have two international hosts at Drag Race Live right now. But only one running. Only one running? What do you mean? Well, Drag Race Talent stopped. Well, for, for now. Of but, course, you know. for now. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, like, yeah. I like how she's been off the air for like a year, and you're like, well, she's irrelevant now. <laughs> she's in black and white. Yeah. Every show. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so amazing because Pangina and I are really good friends, and uh, she's, of course, Thai. I'm French, and this experience of Drag Race is such, it's so crazy mm -hmm. for us. Being able to be reunited in Vegas is really, truly special. Mm -hmm. And also, I think you had her here, and you can tell that she's a rotted, rotted human being. Yeah, she and is. I'm obsessed with her. Yeah, no, she really is. It's like, she's simultaneously like, oh, I'm so thankful for this experience, so congenial. Then at the same time, she's like the shadiest, most vile person you know. Yep. Yeah, it's this duality of man. You know, the, two, <laughs> the two of you together, it's like French and Thai. It's French Thai. It's a, it's a French tie. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats again on the hosting gig. That's really not a bad gig for someone that placed 11th. Li right? Yeah. Literally, I this is the best cash prize you, you could have given me. Mm -hmm. I placed 10th and I didn't get anything. I didn't get shit. Well, you're the host of your own show. No, I, well, in your I living room. I pulled dressed up. as uh, a mime, by the way. <laughs> a mime. Well, so where did this outfit come from in French culture? Like, cause I oh, because I was about to say Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime? Well, I know where I got the outfit. <laughs> Damn, starting off shady already. Uh, but like, where, like, this, like, look, this aesthetic, because I always see it, obviously, like, mimes wear it, but where did it originate from? Just a little history lesson for people. If you know. um, look, I can give you the brainless little fashion queen answer, which is the stripes are more, like, for the sailors and the marines mm -hmm. type of thing. So I would say Jean-Paul Gaultier. If you want the history of where the mimes come from, 
That's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah, just like your outfit, you will have to go on the internet to find the answer. <laughs> Wikipedia, not Amazon, but okay, they'll probably enough, have the enough. answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you are now the third international girl I had because I had Lawrence Chaney, Pangina, and now this. I'm just like collecting the international girls like Infinity Stones at this point. Well, Lawrence is also a great uh, example of how terrible human beings can turn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she's she's amazing. She's been killing it. She's hosting the show every night, and she introduced us in the most vile way possible. Oh, does she? So for me, she says she gives Chucky a run for her money, Nikki doll. For Panjaina, she says the only thing wider than my waist are her shoulders, Panjaina heels. And my favorite one is Kennedy Davenport. She says she is from Texas, but her hairline is from Canada. Kennedy Davenport. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the show in like a little while because I've been, you know, so busy with, you know, my I career and everything. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know how it is. But like, I haven't seen the show, so I haven't got a chance to see like how rotted she is. In per well, I mean, I have seen how rotted she is in person, but not in a show aspect. Yeah. She's just so. as rotted. Mm -hmm. Even in front of RuPaul, she does not back out. Like, she's just going to stay who she is. I know. We all saw the video. She slapped RuPaul. We all slapped, saw it. Yeah. And then she got off script and literally told him, this dress is H&M. <laughs> And Rudy Tree had to say, I love H&M, <laughs> and slap the shit out of her. We're still in damage control for that one. <laughs> yep. How has it been, though, going from a contestant to a host? What was that like? That transition like? The transition has been pretty easy because um, I definitely felt like I had what I needed to be able to help the girls. Mm -hmm. uh, and also being an early out and being someone that was eliminated definitely helped because I know how, what it feels. And I, I know how it feels to to feel overlooked or misunderstood and so they felt safe with me initially they kind of like looked at me like are you gonna judge me mm -hmm. and then after episode one they were like oh thank god it's her mm -hmm. so <laughs> so far i think they've been liking it after your run as an early out and like the critiques it turns you into a kinder gentler judge more soft-handed than rupaul might be absolutely you know what the toughest eliminations are for me the early ones Mm. I cry more for the girls that leave early because I see myself in it. Yeah. And then when it gets to top four, I'm like, bitch, you made it all the way. Ta-ta. Yeah. It's like <laughs> so one girl goes out second, you're like, that girl's going to be on this panel someday. She's going to be somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, ne next year, Kaina is actually taking my, my spot. Yeah. There he already First out on, on season one. Oh, why not? You know? Give hey. the little people a shot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like as a judge, the first time you got to utter the Ruisms, like the start your engines, uh -huh. and ladies, you know, like, what? how did it feel uttering those words for the first time? Um, it was really fun to make it my own and to kind of translate it culturally because obviously trying to translate word by word what Rue says in, in English sounds very stupid in French. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was fun to make it my own and it actually helps me to become a, my own definition of what a host was. But if you ask me what it feels like to say these words, it's actually pretty orgasmic. Like, I think I'm always like a semi hard on when I say it <laughs> because it really feels like you're running a video game mm -hmm. and you're that voiceover and then everybody's like with the joystick. Well, the people watching it are with the joysticks and the girls are just like, I don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really fun to say. Do you feel like a sense of power on the judges panel? Season one, it felt like I was, I had the power, but I didn't want to have it because I felt so bad for them. Mm -hmm. Season two, I was having a great time doing it. You're growing to like the power. Yes, I think yeah. I'm turning into like a awful, awful human being. Mm. Uh, a worse human being. Right. Thank you for that, Maddie. Yeah. Uh, but I still give them a lot of love and and support and uh, and uh, and advice. But I I enjoy mm -hmm. the whole Hunger Game vibe of it because mm -hmm. now I get to be the rich girl with the awful pink wig on the other side who's <laughs> looking at the people, the poor people right. killing each other. <laughs> you were born in France, but you actually traveled around a lot. You didn't yeah. live most of your life in France. So with that, did it make you feel like something of like an outsider whenever you came onto the show? Oh, absolutely. I, so I was born in France, but when I was six, I moved to the Caribbean for seven years. Then I moved to Morocco for seven years, uh, which are both countries that speak, speak French as well. But when I went back to France when I was 18, I felt truly like someone that was not from this country. I might have had like French paperwork, but I was completely lost on what to do. Mm -hmm. um, which is why sometimes I feel more of like an international type of person rather than just French. And so when I got on season 12 and people were expecting more of like the voulez-vous coucher avec moi, ou la la, pipi le pew, and ratatouille, I was like, I don't think I'm that French. Also, by the way, nobody's that French. All of these references are made by America. Mm -hmm. Moulin Rouge is an American movie. Ratatouille is a Disney movie. Mm -hmm. Pipi le pew is not something we watch when we were kids. So like <laughs> these references were not mine. Mm -hmm. But we was like, give us more of that. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. 
because you spent so long in America on the show, do you have like to French people a noticeable American accent now? Oh well, now I I feel like I don't speak neither good French or good good English. Mm. When I go to France, I struggle with my words, and they're like, "Did you go to school?" Mm -hmm. And then here's the same. So like I I think now I'm like the worst side of both. Yeah, but I don't think I have an American accent when I speak French. Okay, so like you're not on the judges panel, like bonjour. No, but I do say things. I do translate Americans sing in French, and then producers will be like. Yeah, that doesn't make sense in French. Mm. So that I'll have to like, ha ha literally ask them for help because yeah. I don't know how to say it. Being on the judges panel, what are some things you learned about the show that you didn't know as a contestant? Um, how much pressure as a contestant you put yourself into. Like you, you, you put yourself through so much, and when you are a judge, a, a judge, you really are looking at the bigger picture. And then, of course, the people that are insecure or do the most are going to stand out for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. When you're on the other side, you really think that everybody is here to get you. That's not the case. At least not in my franchise. <laughs> uh, if you are sabotaging yourself, we're going to see it and we're going to point it out. But it was weird to be like, oh my god, yeah, you really just need to have fun. Uh, and it's really hard when you invested so much money and go through all of this. And we also don't sequester the girls in France because we're not technically allowed. So they have their phone. Oh. They can leave on Sunday. They're not allowed to, like, they don't have to stay in their hotel. So they definitely have it much easier than us. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone is not doing their job, like, I'm definitely more harsh on them than... Yeah. Because I'm like, girl, I did not even have my phone. Yeah. You can watch porn and jerk off. I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, it's... And the American season, they you get on the show and they they bully you and they're cruel to you. But at the same time, whenever you leave the show, you're just a prisoner in a hotel. You just look so at the ceiling and you still have RuPaul and Michelle's face on the on the white wall, <laughs> just saying their things over and over to you until yeah. you pass out and sleep. <laughs> so yeah, with the knowledge you have, like behind the scenes, how the show works, do you think you would do much better if you were to go back for an All Stars with the knowledge you have now? I definitely think so because I'm more I'm less apologetic. I know exactly what I want to do. I'm more assertive. Uh, but I would go back on All Stars only if there was no elimination. Mm -hmm. Well, first, because then I can really have fun. Second, when you go on All Stars, you are, as of now, eliminated by the other girls. Mm -hmm. If I arrive as a host with a career that comes, like, that has like a TV show every year, of course I'm going to have a um, target on my forehead. Like Pangina on UK. Right. And so I, I wouldn't do it. And I, I don't think Brooklyn Heights would do it either, like, or Valentina. Mm -hmm. Because it, they will tell you, like, I need this more than you. Mm -hmm. So if it was no elimination, maybe I would go. And I definitely feel that I would do better. Yeah. Uh, and the good thing with me is that I did so poorly on season 12 that I can only do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, you placed 11. So if you go on a season, there's only 10 contestants. You do better than you did before, no matter what. Uh, you no. really love to remind me that it's 11, that I placed 11. Yeah, yes, I remember. I placed 10. Just so we're clear, the, the power dynamics here. But how many episodes did you do? Uh, I was like five or six. Oh, right, because you guys also didn't have no elimination the mm -hmm. first two episodes. Yeah. I you had like three? Five episodes. You didn't have five. One of those you weren't on. That doesn't count. I was on at the end. That doesn't count. It counts. Did they pay you for that one? Yes. They shouldn't have. And I had to pay for that outfit and that wig, so it counted. It's just not fair. Life's but not fair. Say love you, right? <laughs> Say love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> wow. Uh, so as I said earlier, you were born in France, but you spent most of your time, most of your life, like traveling around all over the place because your mom, every few years or so, would just kind of pack up and just move you elsewhere. Yeah. What, what was the reason for moving so much? Did, was it like for work or did she just have like a wanderlust or like, what was it? My mom always wanted to be uh, traveling the world and she got pregnant and she was like, I'm not going to stop. You're just going to come with me. <laughs> and she, I don't know, she just get bored very easily. Every time she would get bored about a place, we would just move. And also we stayed seven hours on like a tiny little island. So after seven years, it made sense that she was like, okay, we, I've seen it all. So we yeah. need to move. So we moved to Morocco and then I went back to France and said, you're crazy. I need to continue alone. Mm -hmm. So like, it was, there wasn't anything like interesting. Like she wasn't running from anything or had nope. like work. No, nope. she's not illegal. She was not in the military. There's nothing that you see. Mm. She's just bored. <laughs> just bored. <laughs> just bored. <laughs> well, you say like after a while, she thought she kind of saw everything, but she still has that like desire to like travel still because yeah. like, it was shortly after the show that you actually took her to like India. I took her to India, took her to Bangkok, to Thailand, and uh, and she still wants it until now. Like she's 54. And she's telling me, oh, I think I'm going to move to this place and then this place. I'm like, mom, you, you have to think about retirement at some point. Mm -hmm. You need to stay in one place, settle, have a house. Does not care. No, her retirement's going to be like on a boat. So she yep. just Oh, that would be, she would, she would be the happiest in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Like, what, what does she do for work, if you don't mind me asking? To be able to, because I know, like, whenever I moved in my city, just from, like, the same, a different apartment in the same city. Yeah. Like, so much, like, stress and, like, money. Like, how did you, af she afford to, like, travel and just drop everything and move all the time? I don't think she was really able to afford it, to be honest. We went through, like, some tough times, but initially she was a nurse. And then she uh, changed her career into, like, becoming, like, a French teacher. And so now she really teach uh, French. That's what she does. Mm -hmm. And now that she's back in France, she doesn't really do that. She takes care of uh, kids that have, like, not a mental condition, but someone that is that needs, like, an extra care. Mm -hmm. And she's, um, 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 how do you say that in English? She is a, um, uh, we call it a specialized educator. Mm. So she takes care of people that are, um, that have a condition. And then she's going to make sure that they are at the same level as the people that do not have it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Wait, was your dad around at all? Uh, well, he was uh, he was around when uh, I was conceived, but uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have like any connection like to your dad? Or no, anything? not really. Mm. Clearly. <laughs> hey, uh, Pangina was here recently, and like her and her dad are like besties. So you never know. If, if True. Everyone has a different journey. True. So like you never had any correspondence. It was just kind of like he was just a, sp a sperm donor essentially. No, we, we they, they separated when I was six, and then uh, I stayed with my mom. I even had a stepdad, but. My mom did such a good job at being both parents mm. that I never felt like I needed a, f a father figure, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could stay in touch with him, but I just never cared mm -hmm. that much. Hopefully he had, he's not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, do you think he keeps up with like all your drag journeys? I don't know. I guess we'll figure it out. Hi. Oh, <laughs> if, oh I, I know he does know that I, huh. that I do drag. And also in France, it's really hard to miss drag race and, 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 and what I do because I'm... I'm everywhere yeah uh but he hasn't been like really vocal or or um, said anything about it which is also good because i wasn't i was worried that all of a sudden he would come and try to reconnect more than yeah. before mm -hmm. so I, I like that the relationship did not change that much besides the fact that i became you know a very public mm -hmm. figure over there yeah did you watch a lot of code lyoko as a kid not that much to be honest mm -hmm. I was more of a, um, more of a, well, it's kind of like generic, but I was wearing, watching like a lot of Sailor Moon, Cartier of Sakura. Mm. Uh, so you were in anime as like a young kid too. Oh yeah, so absolutely. Code Lyoko, I know it's a big French show, so I was just wondering. No, I was not watching, watching this, but France is the biggest consumer of manga and anime after Japan. So we, we have a lot of uh, anime that didn't even make it to the US that were translated in French and on TV. So, so the it's, French are just a bunch of weeaboos, essentially. Absolutely. Otakus, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of otakus. I would go to this store that would sell the mangas and just sit down and just read all the all the collection of it and then go home. Because mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to pay for it. No. <laughs> well, I couldn't pay for it. Yeah. And you gave me more like Code Lyoko vibes. I don't know why. It's just what I was getting. Maybe it's because you have a big forehead, but I don't know. It's just... Damn. Yeah. Anywho, can I borrow your, your beret to hide it a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people are like, well, why don't you just shave your brows? This will be easier for dragon. I'm like, my future would start right here. Like, my forehead is already so big. Uh -huh. We just like a, a whole space of nothing. <laughs> so, no, I can't. I have to keep Use my brows. Ad space. What did you say? Use it for ad space. <laughs> like a billboard. That's how I should pay my rent. Right. We're getting that. You know, it's everything's getting monetized. Everything's all about business. You know? Yeah. Do you put your ads on your nose? My nose is not that big. Sorry. That's offensive. That's so rude. Is I it? I would never say something like that about no, you. No, sorry. It's like, well, you can. Have you seen my nose? It's about to disappear. I'm just like, two nostrils. <laughs> it's like a little button. I know that it's a straight queen that is wearing na uh, uh, nail polish and like the gay one is not wearing anything. It's because I take my job seriously. Unlike the host of Drag Race France. Oh, it's a job for you? It is a job. It's literally how I pay my bills. Wait, it's my life. This is not a job. Every day is a fucking gift for me. I'm so you don't take your life seriously? Oh. Well, I'm still gay. <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, this is a serious fucking TV show, okay? This is Jag Ray's Maddie's house. Got it. Do you know Aiden? Aiden Zane? Yeah. I haven't met her, no. You haven't met her? Mm -hmm. How do you think she's going to take this? Mm -hmm. She's probably happy for the airtime. <laughs> probably, right? Yeah. But some of the most like crucial years of your life, like most of your teens was spent in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't know, Morocco is not a very gay friendly place. Nope. It's, it's like homosexuality is actually illegal in Morocco. Yeah. So what was it like for you as like a queer child, a queer teenager, learning about yourself and expressing yourself in a country like that? Well, I definitely feel like as much as Morocco is a country where officially um, being gay is illegal, 
it is full of gays, full of it. The hypocrisy is at the highest. Um, so I did have a lot of a sexual experience there, but um, when it comes to understanding my queerness and uh, educating myself back in 2009 and prior, uh, internet was my best friend. That's why I was also a big nerd, is because my computer was my safe space. So it was a bunch of queer as folk, of a lime wire porn downloaded and um and Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. So when when did you start getting into like makeup? Like were you, were you able to do that freely with where you were at or was it something very much like behind closed doors or with like online friends? So when I was a teenager, because I was so such a fan of of, uh, of Japanese pop culture, and I was also kind of like an emo, I used this as an excuse to kind of like start playing with makeup, even though I was straight and an artist, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which obviously we saw how this turned. Um, that's how I started. But then I definitely was uh, practicing at home when my mom was not here, and then we would remove everything before she comes home. Mm. Uh, and that's a way. That's that's how I was able to. To start, but back then when I was playing with makeup, there was no tutorials. There was no drag queen tutorials. I think the first one I've ever seen was this uh, iconic Italian drag queen that was doing uh, tutorials on YouTube, and then Miss Fame was the second one. But that was I was already nineteen when that came out, mm. so I really just had to play. And uh, you do not want to see my first makeups ever. <laughs> it was it was it was a choice. Yeah, pictures of Megan. We'll, we'll get into her in a little. Oof! Bit. You found her. Huh? Did you find photos of her? I don't know. We'll see. Oh, God we'll damn see. it. You're really into makeup whenever you're younger, but you didn't start doing, getting into actual drag until like 2009 yep. for Paris Pride. Yep. And at that point, was, was that Nikki that first debuted or was that Megan? Because I know when you first started, the name was Megan. It was definitely Megan uh, because the goal was to... I wasn't taking drag seriously. It was never a career plan. Uh, so I chose Megan because I wanted to look like Megan Fox. It was, I think it was at the time where I was obsessed with Jennifer's body. Mm. which I think came out that year. Uh, if not, any came out after. I'm just making this up, but I was obsessed with Megan Fox. Uh, but the thing is, I always say I looked more like The Rock than Megan Fox. Like I just had no understanding of makeup in a drag way. There was nothing transformative. I didn't even know how to cor color correct my mustache. So she was, she was a rough girl. Mm. Uh, but it's after me... Uh, dabbling into into uh, makeup and and, and cross dressing, that I realized that I could enjoy my craving for the stage because I always wanted to sing and be on stage and be like the David Bowie or like the boy version of Lady Gaga. So by creating Nikki Doll, I was able to create this avatar that would allow me to perform and and reconnect with the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, but Megan was ultimately just to have fun initially. <laughs> was was this uh, was this Megan or was this Nikki? Oh, you're lucky. I got so scared. This is a very early Nikki doll. Okay, so this is like just post Megan. Yes, I don't think you. I don't think if I did my my job correctly, there's no picture of Megan that is. Mm -hmm. um, I can find you one. You want to see? Please send it to me so we can put it on the screen. Oh, okay. I think the only place where Megan exists is on my Facebook, and it's on like private albums mm. but because i like you i will show you did you have like an old like tumblr or anything that was like posted to yeah like, but not with some megan pictures with other stuff <laughs> let me tell oh, you that well. <laughs> oh no <laughs> not oh no and you were a makeup artist oh no at the time i was not yet okay but one, one thing we have in common <laughs> no, no no nails <laughs> the lack of nails it's that little piece of megan that's still with you to yes this day. if there's one thing I hate in drag uh, its nails. I love how it looks and I have like very thin hands so it looks really good on me but changing wearing nails it's the absolute worst so I don't and you paint yours so technically. I actually did a campaign for a, uh, a painkiller uh, spray that you would use on your feet mm. and then I worn Oh, Asper Cream. Yes, Asper Cream. I worn fake nails, to fake toenails. Did you oh. know that that existed? I can nails. order them on Amazon. Yeah, I, I used to do uh, drag pageants, and I've worn like little press-on toenails before. That's so geeky. Yeah, because I'm like, because like I don't want man feet to show. I also like the thing I hate more than nails is Barbie feet. Like when you're in drag and you have feet that look like a Barbie's feet, yeah, no toes. I don't like that. Not for me. So I either wear closed toes or I will put little press-ons for if it's like a pageant. Or do something. you have a nice like feet? Is Maddie has like nice, feet, nice looking feet, or are you like a golem type of girl? No, not a golem. I don't think I have. I don't think I have ugly feet, but I don't think I have like womanly feet. You know. Do you have long toes? Not, no, not super long. I think they're proportional. Mine are so long, like they oh. match my, my my fingers. Like if I pinch you with my toes, you'll bruise. 
Oh, you got grabbers. Yeah, yeah I can grab. I can grab everything. Oh Maybe not like a Red Bull can, but I will grab a necklace with it. See, in here, I thought you weren't talented. This whole time. They didn't ask me to do that. I would have gone to the finale. On <laughs> season twelve, all stars talent show. I could recurl Rue's hair. Yeah, with my it, toes. <laughs> that's why you were such a successful like makeup artist and stylist because you could do multiple projects at once. Literally, I would never have to look at my kit. I would just grab it uh -huh. and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just ratatouille. Just. Literally, <laughs> not this. Uh, I knew it was coming. Wait, by the way. Oh, that's our producer. That's your producer? Yeah, that's the one, that's the one who pulls the strings around here. Got it. That's Remy. <laughs> yeah, French icon. What, what, what is the reception to Remy in France? Like Ratatouille, the movie. Did the French, like, do they fuck with that movie? Do I they think like they fuck with that movie way more than Emily in Paris. <laughs> that's like for Emily sure. Emily in Paris. Yeah, Emily in Paris. This bitch is wearing Louboutin everywhere in Paris. There is not a single living soul that would wear a Louboutin in Paris. Mm -mm, nope. It's just not doable. Also, have you seen this bitch on the subway? No. There's also like neighborhoods that are so sketchy in Paris. Emily would have her phone, her, her computer, her bag stolen. So, and she's fine everywhere. But she's always in like the center next to the river. Yeah. Paris is so big. So they, 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 they wear like sensible shoes, black and white striped shirts, neck scarves. That's the standard issue dress. No That's, Louboutins. No. Nope. Yeah. You look like every neighbor I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> But when did you start getting like into the makeup art? Because obviously it wasn't then. So like, when did you start really getting into makeup? So technically, I started uh, communication studies when I was eighteen after after graduating, and I was broke, and so it was hard for me to be able to just commit to studying because I needed to pay my rent. And after three years, I realized that financially was not sustainable for me to only study. Mm -hmm. So then, my best friend, who was a makeup artist at Mac, told me, "Why don't you just take a, a year off?" and just focus on doing makeup because you're so good at doing it on yourself and I think you really have what it takes. I fell in love with makeup and loved using my, you know, my empathy and, and my social skills to really help people just build confidence because yeah. being a makeup artist really allows people to... I remember the first time I've ever had a girl that came and she had cancer, she had no brows and teaching her how to do her brows like made her life and she gave her, gave her so much confidence. So I realized that the power of makeup then, mm -hmm. and and I continued and until I became a freelance makeup artist. So I, I quit Mac and then I was working really in the fashion industry mm -hmm. uh, until Nikki took over. Yeah, but Miki, Nikki was always the the backbone of the makeup artist. She was always there, she even though I there. never thought she would. I never thought I would be a professional drag queen. For mm -hmm. me, the, and I feel I'm so ashamed to say that. But back then, I, I felt like it was kind of like a tacky aspect to it like oh i'm a professional drag queen thinking like i would do you know seven days a week work and like doing a, a brunch and then a, a weddings and things like this i never thought that would be me yeah, I, feel, I feel like you went so far so fast like as far as like makeup art goes like some people they do freelance makeup art a couple weddings here and there but in just like a, a few years you went from doing freelance makeup to doing stuff for like major publications yeah how did you get to that point so fast um, when I moved to San Francisco at the time, I I knew that in order to be able to get to that small sphere of privileged uh, um, team of artists that can really work in the industry and with really big clients, I needed to build my portfolio. So I was never focused on quick money like weddings or things like this. Mm -hmm. I was always focused on editorials. What am I going to work with? What are his photos? How am I going to be able to have a website that looks as clean as possible? in order to fake it till I make it, because that has been the story of my life. And my goal was to find an agency that would be able to represent me. So I worked almost for a year for free, just because I wanted to build a portfolio. And that's really what helped me to, to showcase my work to people. But whenever you moved to the US, you actually didn't move for makeup, you moved because of a boy. You moved mm -hmm. all the way from Paris to San Francisco. Did you have a plan, really? Because like, you did a lot of makeup for free, but you moved to like one of the most expensive cities in the U.S. Like, right. What was your plan? My plan was to get there. I saved money. I Actually, in Paris, I took a loan. And please, guys, don't do that. But I took a loan, and I said to my banker, like, oh, I want to buy, I wanna buy a, buy, uh, um, a motorcycle. So, and I had a really, like, really good rapport with my, uh, with my banker. So I, I took like 10K, I think, and then I moved to the U.S., and then I just reimbursed month by month. But that's how I was able to survive for like a short amount of time. Uh, I was working for this brand that was kind of like the Uber, the Uber for makeup called something. Glam Squad. I was part of Glam Squad, which was like 
you would go at someone's hotel or someone's house and you would be paid seven, seven, seventy dollar just for like a little makeup. That's how I was paying my bills. And then all, all of the rest was to uh, invest in my own career. Hmm. So essentially you lied to your bank. That's, that's lied to my bank. It. Yeah. You said I need money for a motorcycle and then you just like use that money to move. Move to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Did you learn tricks from your mom about how to like uproot yourself? Did you <laughs> use those the tricks you learned? As you a know child? what? I wish she had these tricks because we would have probably struggled less. Because she would have had 10k to move to the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> so with your career as a makeup artist, like all the publications and everything you've done, the people you've worked with, what's been the highlight for you so far as a makeup artist? As a makeup artist, my highlight has been... SNL? That's a good question. Well, yeah. As, as a drag makeup artist, SNL has definitely been uh, a fun one. To be fully transparent, and I've never said that, I think, I'm not like the proudest of the makeup that I've done on Pete Davidson. I think I did what I could given the time that we had and his face, there's <laughs> not so much you can do. Um, but I, I definitely did much better drag makeup in the past. But the fact that Rue asked me specifically to do it and something as big as SNL, because my makeup career was never really TV oriented, it was always like print and editorials. Uh, but it was a fun one, it was definitely a fun one. Otherwise I think, uh, I mean of course when you published in, on Vogue for the first time, it's always something that you're like, wow, I made it. Uh, it's never paid, but I was in Vogue. What is it like having Pete Davidson as a drag daughter? It is amazing. I just wish he didn't delete his social media since he broke up with Ariana Grande. Mm. Doesn't really have a great reputation, so I have a problematic drag daughter. But that's okay. I'll I'll make sure to fix that. <laughs> but he's really fun. He does smoke a blunt every seven minutes, though. Mm -hmm. Like I was high just by being next to him. Just secondhand. Yes. Just he would leave, come back, and by the end, I was just like high. Mm. It was, uh, it was wild. So what are you most proud of outside of drag? The accomplish accomplishments you've had as a makeup artist, a designer, or a model? A designer? You made some outfits. Oh, yeah, but I'm no designer. Okay, so I not was a designer. De no, not designer. I was definitely more a stylist. I'm a drag stylist. I can, stylist. I can, I can go on Amazon, buy like the cheapest shit, and put it all together and like create a look. Well, I create the look. Oh. You just put Amazon. I'm a trailblazer, too. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> this is gonna be the hottest in American fashion soon. So, yeah. Well, you saw the outfit that I went home on. RuPaul wore one just like it, like two episodes later. You know what? It is. That's true. You you follow the steps of Naomi Small's um, newspaper address, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's true that she wore. That was a choice. Yeah, that was a choice. Um, so you think you you think you're responsible for that? Probably. She probably had people change it. Like, get me that, but make it look somewhat chic. Do you think she succeeded at that? No. Oh. That was an ugly dress. It was ugly when I made it, it was ugly when someone else made it too. I think the ugliest part of your outfit that day was not even the dress, it was the wig. The wig? Yeah. I was doing the best with what I got. Like I told you, I was so poor. That was a wig I got from Amazon, and I spray painted it to make it more colorful for a different look. I didn't have anything, and that's what I had. Well, we saw. I don't need to be reminded. Now you're trying to humble me. Well, we're trying to forget it. So the least you could do is to be reminded by it because we can't forget it. Okay, 11th place. Anyway. <laughs> but wait, I didn't even answer your question. I think I, I'm definitely more proud of what I've done as a model because I was able to um, share more message than being part of the mechanism of someone else's career, you know? Mm. Being, as a model, I was, I was my own career, my own a represented and I think I was sharing a lot of message when I was modeling for Vogue for example I was able to share to tell my story so I think modeling has been more uh, rewarding for sure. You've been referred to as a fashion queen before on a scale of 1 to 10 how fashion forward do you think you really are with 10 being fashionable and 1 being just pretentious? <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> I don't think I'm pretentious. I think there's more fashion queen that are pretentious. I'm, I'm, I'm a fake fashion queen. Mm. I love fashion. I love the history of it. I, I love patterns and textures and colors, but I'm not a label whore per se. Because um, you hate Louboutins. I hate walking in them, mm. but I do have a collection of them. Well, yeah. you hate other people walking in them too, like Emily. In Paris, yes, absolutely. I don't think that nobody should wear Louboutins in Paris. It's not made for it. Uh, and I hate the people that wear Louboutins that they can actually spend the whole night in them. Because mm. my claws are very upset by that. Because <laughs> they can't fit in it for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> Louboutin is like a, a bedroom to cab, cab to VIP, VIP to cab, cab to home. Mm. With, with like your toes too and like the Louboutins, you, have, you probably have like a lot of like toe cleavage that shows too. Oh, I, yes, absolutely, yes. Um, 
I should show my I should show you my toes off camera. You will probably off camera. Scream. We'll put that behind a paywall so people can like pay for it. So <laughs> okay, sounds good. Monetize everything. Patreon, everybody. Patreon. Patreon. Where we can get our money. Well, it depends. If you show your toes and then my toes and yours touch, maybe it's an OnlyFans. Ooh, you want to collab? Yeah, let's do it. You want to lock them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. Like this one's called the French Connection. Work. And even though you came to New York to like expand more like your makeup career, you also grew a presence like in the drag scene, eventually getting on Drag Race. And we're only going to talk about Drag Race for a moment because there's only very little to talk about. But, uh -huh. but being cast on the U.S. season, but originally being from another country, what were your worries going into the season? Um, my worries were that it would happen exactly how we did. I thought that I was like, oh, I'm going to be like this, uh, you know, um, uh, American dream success story of this person that drops everything around with one suitcase and a hundred dollar in her pocket and somehow made it. And it was not that. It was more like, no, you're going to be like the French queen that thinks she knows everything about fashion, but there's this like little queen from Chicago that actually knows more than you. Mm -hmm. And she's going to become your nemesis you know, ver kind of like a Miss Fame, Violet Chachki story. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it, season 12 was pretty much like the worst case scenario of what could have happened to me on Drag Race. So the worst case scenario is reality. Yeah. But because I, I feel too that it, the biggest <laughs> issue was like the acting challenges because you were in the bottom for both the acting challenges like in the time you were there. Do you th feel like a lot of that has to do with like the language barrier? Well, yes. And I, as much as people can say like, no, look at Yara Sofia and Alexis Mateo. I didn't want to rely on stereotypes. It was really hard for me to be like, ha, 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 we will baguette. Because that's just not how I talk or how I know how to be French. Mm -hmm. But I, it was hard to not be able to have the same cultural references for people to be able to laugh. Because uh, like I said on, on season 12, and people have been saying, they've been calling me the goofy queens. Because I was like, but I'm so goofy. And they're like, oh, Nikki, the goofy queen. Because they didn't believe any of it. It's that I'm actually not someone that takes herself seriously at all. Mm -hmm. But you have to have the reference. I have a very dry sense of humor. Kind of like you, to be honest, but... But less successful. You? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, like, it's, it's... You have to have the references to be able to laugh at it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was a very big frustration for me. Mm -hmm. To realize that I actually had not enough worldwide references for Americans to be able to rely on. Yeah, you made it through one of the lip syncs, but ended up going home episode five. Episode Four? five. Episode mm -hmm. five, because Heidi was better than you. But if you by had, like, using her wigs or by but, not knowing the words, well, she still beat you. So on the edit. Oh, see, you host a show now, so now you know. See, you heard it here from one of the hosts. No, I was actually very happy to be. Look, I said my own name when they, when 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 the lady said, "Who do you think should go home and why?" I already checked out at that time. I was like, "I'm done. There's no way I'm going to be able the better the best version of myself on this show." Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, I'm going to turn into this monster that is so bitter and upset that I'm going to become diabetic on her season. Who makes it all the way to the finale? Who I love, but I did not have the shoulders. Mm -hmm. when you look at this tiny petite shoulders. I couldn't be able to do that. So I decided to just give up. So when Heidi was lip syncing, I was hoping she would win. Then she lost her wig and I was like, well, I guess I'm here for another episode. And then they still kept her because they were like, no, no, you need to go home. It's done. <laughs> They're like, Heidi, just put your wig on. We'll, we'll figure it out. But if, if you had like made it through that lip sync, how far in the competition do you think realistically you would have gone? I actually think that after that episode, I could have probably stay. I think Snatch Game would have been really funny because I wanted to do Marie Antoinette as Perry Silton in Simple Life, like someone that is completely disconnected from reality. Mm -hmm. And that was an American reference. So I would have been able to play my Frenchness into an American concept. Uh, and I think after that was the political challenge. I think I would have been able to stay maybe t like another two episodes. Mm -hmm. The worst part for me was the beginning of the season. The improv broke me from the beginning. Do, do you think you would have leaned more in a little bit into French stereotypes for the political challenge? Very like liberty and you know. I would have been able to like use some of what they wanted to hear yeah. for sure. Almost like a stereotypical Joan of Arc type character. Yes. Yeah. I would have set myself on fire and everything. On your season because you went home so early, what are you most upset about missing out on? Um, that's, you know, season 12 is so long ago for now, like, it's really hard to remember. Yeah. Oh, the Rusical, Madonna the Rusical, mm -hmm. I was so upset, because I'm such a big fan of Madonna, and Jada's uh, role, which was the, um, which was the era of, like, the vixen, sexy, dark Madonna, which is ex everything that I love, mm -hmm. I would have slay the Rusical, like, uh, I would have slay it, for sure, so I was upset by that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the finale, that's, uh. Well, no, actually, because the finale had to be on Zoom. 
So mm. technically, I was not really upset to not be in the finale. Like that would have been a really fucked up experience. Mm. Well, during around that time, you were doing like online shows anyway, so you might as well do it on VH1. Yeah, I've been through the whole concept of how they had to get get ready, and it was it was pretty wild. No, it was no, no, it wasn't no. What an interesting season. I remember when I was eliminated. Usually, you know, when you're eliminated, I mean, you obviously know you, you were eliminated. So my last gig was Roscoe's before the pandemic, like the quarantine thing. And it was uh, in February. I was eliminated uh, a week after my birthday in March. And because it was quarantining, I was eliminated on my couch. And then the show ends. And then it was just like the ads on VH1. And I was just to get myself. And it was quiet. No drinks. No one cheering your name. Nothing. I just went to bed an hour after. Mm. And I was like, "That's it. That my uh, my era just ended." It was wild. Mm. So I'm glad that I was gone rather early because it was a really tough time to be on TV. <laughs> you just like quietly just faded. Everybody say love, and then poop. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at the screen like this, and I was like, "Well, that's it. That's so, it. Yeah, that's literally what happened." Yeah. Shower and went to bed. Mm -hmm. You say like, turn it on, uh, crunchy roll. No, I was crying. I went to bed. Oh. <laughs> just slept. I was sad. I was really sad. It was hard to believe it. I don't know about you, but rewatching all of it was really intense. I have a problem. I, I, I didn't even want to watch it. Just be, I just like, but I had to, so I knew what was going to be seen. So I knew what to respond to. How did you experience that whole Untucked with Jasmine? Because that was a tough one for you. In person or like on the show? When you watch it on TV. On it was, I was upset because like in the moment there was a lot more, but they can only show so much because that argument was way longer than 30 minutes. Really? Yeah. So we were going at it for a while. There's a lot more context that you missed out on because I was fully like Jasmine's wrong in this moment. Other people were chiming in. So I was like, I literally thought it was going to be like me versus the villain. And uh, the way it was edited, it was just an incoherent fight between two people. So I was like, oh. Yeah. But um, you said earlier, you feel like people perceive you as this very like serious person what's another like misconception that you think people have about you um, i think a big mis mis uh, misconception is that if you only solely watch season 12 or the lip sync assassin episode is that people like that nikki doll cannot really fully perform it's just that i and i'm sure you you, you feel the same way it's like well, i don't know if you really dance per se like you're very funny and you make mixes right mm -hmm. when you perform for me it's like I, I i have a very specific genre of songs that i love to do and on the three times that you see me perform on both season 12 and the Lip Sync Assassin thing, it's not really what I serve on. So if you haven't seen my show, if you haven't seen me perform on the show or, or, um, or at the club, you really don't know exactly what I can bring. Mm -hmm. Nancy Sinatra, Boots Are Made For Walking is definitely not a song I would have picked. Mm -hmm. Or at least I would have done the Jessica Simpson version of it, you know? Yeah. So it's just, yeah, that's one misconception that people can have. Mm -hmm. And then whenever they come to see me at the club or they see me in Vegas, they're like, oh my God, I had no clue. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, follow me, mm -hmm. bitch. Some of the best advice you've ever received was from RuPaul. When RuPaul told you, don't read the comments. Those people voted for Trump. Yep. What is some of the worst advice you've ever received? From Ru? In general. Oh, um, to, um, to always take the high road. Mm -hmm. I think that some, some of these bitches sometimes need to know your true self. Uh, so recently there has been a queen that has been trying me. Um, who um, I gave 4K, $4,000 to help her for not getting evicted. And I thought mm -hmm. that she was a friend and I was helping her out. And then she had the nerve to think that because I'm successful, I don't need that money and thought that she could just unfollow and block me and not pay me back. And uh, I almost took her to court. And um, by the time this air, if she didn't pay me back, her name was probably going to be online. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I feel like you need to show people that they have to respect you because people can mistake kindness for weakness and I'm definitely not weak so so sometimes the high road is litigation yes mm -hmm. literally <laughs> say her name maybe soon pay me bitch well you don't need it you're famous anyway you're doing well for yourself. Yeah, but I, look, I do always, I like money and if I work really hard I do want to have my money in my bank account what what's more upsetting to you not getting that four thousand dollars back, or people thinking that you're a bad lip syncer because of the assassination episode. <laughs> Did you think I assassinated the episode? <laughs> well, you were an assassin that episode. So someone said which one, which someone, one was more upsetting. Someone said in the in the comments, she's not a lip sync assassin, she's a lip sync corpse. I screamed. The thing about me is if you're very funny on how you drag me, mm -hmm. I will be a good I will love it. Yeah. I, I agree. A lot of people they they make straight jokes all the time. And I don't mind if they're funny. 
Right. Like, whenever someone said that I was going to be a lip sync assassin to Nickelback, that's so fucking funny. And I would love the to see that. Time. The right. first time. It's very funny. Right. But What are the songs that you usually sync at on? I do a lot of, like, mixes, sound bites. Like, I'm not a dancer. Yeah. I just, like, take songs and kind of, like, twist them and turn them on their head a little bit. It's right. Like, the creativity. So, if you give me a song... I need to like make a character for it. Right. You need to figure out like the yeah. hidden message. Like, I can't. I can't just throw on like a leotard. That's you know. That's for Jasmine Kennedy. Jasmine Kennedy. Yeah. The New York Queens. <laughs> because yeah, I I can't do the same backflip and split into every song like she can. You know, I have to think and create something and be artistic. Right. You talented. Know? Yeah. Talented. Yeah. I like you know, I'm a thinker. You know. Yeah. I get that, but I don't anyway. think she would get it because yeah. you need to think to get it. But I get. Yeah. It. As much as I would love to talk shit about Jasmine, that is the end of our time that we have. We do have to rush you off to your gig. You're one of your last shows at Drag Race Live. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for joining us today. Nikki, Drag Race Live is coming to an end, uh, but Drag Race France is on right now. Where yeah. else can people find you? You can follow me, of course, on all social media at the Nikki Doll, uh, Venmo included, and PayPal. But if you are in Europe uh, this fall, I will be hosting and performing for the Drag Race Friends Season 2 uh, show. So you guys can see me there. But I might be back in Vegas, honestly, next year. I really enjoyed the whole experience. Yeah. You should come like in the wintertime so you get to enjoy it without the heat. That's the smart thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would do that. Otherwise, I'll just come and hang out here with that AC blazing. Yeah. Last thing. <laughs> well, I don't know how you can record a show with mics and still have the AC mm -hmm. and you can't hear it. Because I remember when I used to do these YouTube videos, mm -hmm. I would have to turn it off. It wasn't so good at first, but you know, over time, I'm learning. I, uh, I may not have been the best on Drag Race, but I hey, am. Michelle Visage told me something. Drag Race starts when Drag Race ends. And I might have not been good on Drag Race Season 12, but I've been killing it after. So... Mm -hmm. I know, like, unlike most queens, you've really been out there getting stuff handed to you, so it's, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, sure, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Very fortunate. Really good! Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's the end of the episode. Tune in next time whenever we have somebody else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, till then. Ta-ta! <laughs>